I'm Vidangi. I'm 21 years old and I love going on adventures. I love riding my bike and I love talking about it. So storytelling is like a big thing for me. And my journey kind of started when I rode my bike across Himalayas. I was 17 back then and that was I was literally on a hundred pan bike. I was on a hybrid. I uh, had no idea what I was doing, but yeah, that happened. And then I moved to the UK as soon as I turned 18 and I started doing a degree in sports management, which I don't do anymore. But <laughs> I, um, when I came here, I wanted to introduce myself to the culture and I found it really hard to make friends at first. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to ride my bike more and find out like that so I decided to ride my bike across the country basically and then I went on to do London Edinburgh London and and I had an had an injury on my knee so I was like right that's not happening so I kind of got disqualified no DNF'd that's the that's the term but yeah (laughs) and I after that I still kind of continued my journey and came back to uh, London and I kind of realized that you know what, like, I started something, I faced some really hard time and essentially failed and still I finished what I started. I remember like, during that journey, and also during when I was doing my ride across the country uh, to John O'Groats, I realized that I was reading this book called This Road I Ride by Juliana Buring. And I was like, right, I'm gonna try something similar or something on those lines. And I think I can, I think I can, you know, step up the game. And it feels really good to be alone, have everything I love on my bike and just ride. And that sense of freedom that I felt, I wanted to keep feeling it. So I was like, right, that that was kind of how I decided to go around the world. And I, I thought I might as well go for the record to be the youngest woman and the fastest woman to do it. Obviously, I did not get the record to be the fastest woman because a lot and a lot of things went wrong when I was doing it. So I started when I was 19 and I reached the halfway point like a day before my 20th birthday. And yeah, I think after that, everything kind of started going wrong with me, uh, which was quite funny. But anyway, um, I kind of, so yeah, at the age of 20, I rode my bike around the world. All of it was solo. Most of it was self-supported. And yeah, that, that's kind of me. And ever since then, like I've been planning expeditions and adventures for others. So I've been involved in a lot of kind of expedition management stuff. So I'm working on a few kind of there's someone who's running across Europe and there's someone who is going to Antarctica. So there are two polar journeys that I'm managing um, and that comes with a lot of kind of, I don't know, it's 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 very like, it feels, I feel like a grown up when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it involves loads of like fundraising, brand management and, you know, assessing the risks, looking at literally all the logistics and I absolutely love it because I like to think of myself as a very organized person. So this is like what I love to do. Vidanga, I'd love to hear more about your childhood and and growing up. I believe that your father was very sort of influential um, in your life in terms of encouraging you to explore the outdoors and the mountains and and the sea. Was that where your passion for the outdoors came from? Yeah, yeah, it did. So my father, in his youth, he used to be super, super, super adventurous. He used to go on like long distance hikes and stuff in the Himalayas. And I think that's where I really picked it up from. And I do remember I was supposed to go on this, um, I was supposed to go on this camp, basically, a summer camp. And um, a part of that was to learn how to do valley crossing river crossing all that and obviously I was what seven eight something like that I don't even remember how old I was I was just tiny that's all I remember and my dad was like oh let's try this and so he kind of tied a rope from a fixed gymnastic rod and a security door and he was like ah why don't we kind of you know and, and then he kind of tied me to the rope with my mum's scarf and that's how I kind of learned valley crossing. And I think it's it's quite funny. It was like now when I look back at it, I'm like, 
holy shit, I can see everything that's wrong with it. But (laughs) (laughs) it was such a good kind of starting point because when I actually did it, I was like, oh, wow, this is so much better than doing it, you know, tied to a rope with a scarf. I feel so much safer with the actual stuff attached to me. (laughs) Um, But anyway, yeah, so my dad has played a major role in me kind of wanting to pursue like the big dreams that I usually have. And um, I remember even when I was supposed to, like even when I said that I wanted to do the Himalayan ride, um, I did it solo because I wasn't allowed I was only 17 so I wasn't allowed to do it in it with with the organized groups because obviously with the insurance and stuff they needed me to be over 18 to do it and I was like I won't be around when I'm 18 I need like I'll be in the UK so you know I need to do it now and then I just said to my dad I was like Hey, like, look, I, I I need to do this now. I want to do this now, and I know I can do it. And then he was like, right, okay. And he he was like, okay, cool, yeah, why not? But don't do it entirely alone. How about me and my mom? Oh no, no, sorry, me and basically my mom, my dad and my mom. That's what I'm getting at. They wanted to also experience the Himalayas, so they kind of jumped in jumped in a car and they <laughs> they were like in 10 kilometer radius or something and yeah they used to wave at me keep driving and they got their own experience out of it and I was just riding by myself having the time of my life but he was the one who kind of told me that look if you can do that then you can dream bigger and like and every time I kind of there, there's always a tentative part in, in in me which always goes oh I, I have this big dream I'm not sure though if I've got it in me like you know and then I kind of that's when I talk to my dad and I'm like hey what do you think like you know do you think I, I've got it and he's like you can do this he keeps telling me like you bungee jumped you can do anything you want like you are strong enough to do anything you like and yeah that that kind of confidence that he is kind of shown in me makes me believe more in myself that's why I have been able to feel confident enough to get to the start line and see it through to the finish line do you know what I really love about what you've just shared then is that the support that your parents have shown you and, you know, inspiring you with confidence and love and that, look, you had this dream when you were 17 that you wanted to cycle across the Himalayan, you know, passes. And they are there in the car, you know, 10 kilometers away, but just being there supporting you while you are having um, the time of your life. Like, I think that's, that's incredible. How was cycling across the, the Himalayas? What sort of distances were you covering? How long were you out there for? Um, you know, yeah, what, what was that like? I think I was out there for a couple of weeks and I was not covering a lot of distance every day. But the elevation gain and the altitude and the effects of altitude were quite severe. And I I do say that, obviously, I did cycle across the Himalayas, but there's a pass that I, in fact, like, because obviously my dad has a severe case of asthma and he was having some troubles with it. And I remember it's, it's, I don't remember the name of the pass, but there's like 21 loops. They're called gata loops and like switchbacks. And it's amazing. Like, it's so beautiful. I remember doing that and I did not know that there was like a longer route to the top of the pass, which meant that I wasn't able to like, um, I, I, I felt like the effects of altitude so bad that I was just like, shit, I, I can't walk. I can't breathe. I can't do this. And then, yeah, there was, obviously there was a car that my parents were in. And when they found me in that, you know, being being struggling like that, they thought I wasn't going to kind of make it basically to the top. <laughs> so um, there was one pass that I did not do and it still bothers me so much. It's like, ah, uh, like, you know, I, <laughs> I, I did the rest of the route, which was 800 kilometers, I believe. And I was covering one pass every day. And then I was just kind of aiming to do um, 
yeah, one long uphill, one long downhill and a little bit. So it came to around, oh God, my maths is dwindling. <laughs> <laughs> it started with, so the first day was like 35 kilometers, but it was all, all of it was uphill and all of it was steep. And I remember thinking, holy shit, if the whole route is like this, then I'm probably going to really, really struggle. And I may have realized that actually the more we rode, so the more I rode, the stronger I felt until that pass where obviously <laughs> I was taken over in a car after I had done all those loops and I didn't get the bloody downhill after that. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's like the experience of of being in the mountains and feeling insignificant is beautiful like everywhere you look it's just tall mountains or fast flowing river and an odd waterfall in distance and blue skies scorching heat and just you know and the roads aren't really great but it, it's just yeah riding there feels like you're in heaven like that's literally how I can imagine heaven feeling and being like it's so beautiful and yeah I think I really um I really fell in love with the outdoors in like a very true sense during that expedition now I call it an expedition because that that ride across the Himalayas was a larger Thing than anything anything I had ever done or thought of so for me it was an expedition at the time um, but yeah that that's how it really kind of felt to do that ride I felt completely kind of you know getting to know my surroundings and trying to you know get the feel of how the terrain kind of I don't know, just dealing with the terrain and trying to work with it and learning how to work with it. It, it was amazing. It was like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I find really fascinating is when I when I was your age, I just didn't even think about these these challenges and these opportunities that were out there, whether that's cycling across the Himalayas or deciding, you know, to to go and cycle around the world. Did you have role models when you were growing up? Did were there women in your life or women online who you followed and looked up to and, and who inspired you? As long as I was in India, I wasn't using social media that much. So I definitely didn't really have any kind of um, role models or female role models that much. I knew people who had cycled around the world before. And there, uh, one thing I prominently remember is a girl called... Krishna Pato, who was 19 when she climbed Everest, and she was from the same place that I was kind of studying. And I remember um, in my English textbook, there was a lesson about her. And I remember thinking, wow, I wonder, like, when I'm 19, if I can do something like that. And I remember thinking, I wonder if one day I can do something that is textbook worthy, like, you know, enters an English textbook. That's like one of the really kind of big things <laughs> growing up in India has taught me. Like if you, if you make an appearance in a, in a textbook, then you've probably made it sort of thing. But anyway, um, I didn't really have any kind of role models, role models, but the fact that my dad had so much trust in me <laughs> and like, you know, he genuinely believed that I was capable of achieving big things. And I think he was my role model. And then, obviously, when I moved to the UK, after the Himalayan ride, then when I moved to the UK, I had exposure to the concept of bikepacking. I didn't even know when I rode across, uh, when I rode from Bournemouth to John O'Groves, I had no clue what I did was called as bikepacking. And somehow, like, someone mentioned it on a, in a comment and I saw that and I looked up and I, I was reading a book by Juliana Beering, as I said, um, and I remember thinking, oh, wow, like, she's amazing. I wonder... 
who else is out there? And then, yeah, I the more kind of exposure I got to other women and other people who have done amazing things, the more I kept thinking, oh, wow, like, you know, like, I I want to I want to do something that big as well and I want to kind of <laughs> I want to challenge myself and see what I'm capable of because yeah I think role models as such was like my dad's role but also what, what the people I'd been reading of I used to read like magazines a lot adventure magazines so outside magazine was so like I used to read it online but National Geographic or um sidetrack magazine I think it was new back then but I don't remember but yeah I, I remember reading stuff like that and just thinking to myself wow like there's there's a big world out there and I I know I'm not old enough probably to do anything but I want to I want to explore. I want to see what I can do and see where I can get. So 19, 19 years old was when you started your round the world record attempt. Tell me what it was like in the run up to starting. Tell, I'd love for you to share more about the planning, the preparation, the funding, like how much organisation that you needed to do in order to get this dream off the ground and to start on this challenge. I would say when I started, I wasn't enough prepared for it. I would definitely say that now because, yeah, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> um, but run, like in the run up to it, it was hard because I was in my second year of university. So I had that. Plus I had to train for this and I wasn't sure I I, I think I was overtraining myself at some point and then I took a bit of a break and then I was just kind of overtraining again or something because I remember never having had enough sleep in the run up to the to the actual like expedition because I was always working on something and it was really hard because I mean I can imagine why I found it so hard to be sponsored I was I started asking for sponsorships when I was like 18 and obviously you still don't know a lot about the world and it's hard to trust someone that young with say a bike or you know or or with a lot of money or whatever it is so I think that was definitely a big challenge which I kind of found it easier when I actually went to um Kendall Mountain Festival or I went to London Bike Show and I actually spoke with people and brands and I it was as if I had no fear in my head I just would go to brands and be like hey I'm Vidangi I'm 18 19 whatever I was and I'm planning on doing this um I know you have some amazing people working with you but is there any chance I can get xyz from you sort of thing or you know just just asking for little things and some equipment and by the end of it somehow I had Alpkit on board and I remember um it wasn't great when I spoke with Alpkit because I was I, my my voice was shaky and I was really scared and I was like this is not gonna work <laughs> and it somehow did and it was amazing because they helped me very kindly with all the bike packing gear, all the camping gear, literally like, yeah, my sleeping bag, baby bag, tent, everything, everything, everything. In the end, I didn't even carry the tent, but it was really kind of them to offer me one. And as far as training was concerned, I think I... I I just made sure that I was able to do the distance that I was planning to do daily, back to back. So I I would go away for like a week and every day do the distance and just stay the night in like, I don't know, in a bus shelter or something like that and just somehow make it through basically. And I also did some rides across the country. So I would like go from Bournemouth all the way to Scotland somewhere and come back. And I had done a ride from like um, Lands End to Dover and back no uh, lands into Dover and then to Bournemouth back to Bournemouth sort of thing and I kept trying to make this whole um bike packing thing my new normal 
and I try to make it like you know uh, bring it into my life a lot and obviously that didn't go down well as far as university was concerned because I wasn't doing very well with my uh, studies at that point because I was just out always and if I wasn't out I was emailing sponsors I was yeah make myself ready for this and in the middle of all that I all of it I decided that I wanted this filmed in some sections probably so I started emailing production companies and most of them said no and then I was like okay maybe that's not never going to happen so fuck it basically a month less than a month to go I heard back from Antil Productions based in Canada and they are a lot into mountain biking and filming mountain biking basically and I don't know why <laughs> they, they got back to me and they were like um, right so we would love to kind of speak with you and see what you're planning and then yeah just kind of had a conversation with them and I said to them that look I've got a couple of friends who study either photography or like film and they are quite, like they're really willing to kind of work with you guys and um whatever bits there are to film they are willing to kind of fly out film those bits and kind of continue with university sort of thing and is is that possible are you okay with it and yeah they say they said yes and uh it was all kind of planned and once the production company came in a lot lot more sponsors came in and suddenly i had enough money to do this and i had enough kind of gear resources everything i, I had it all in place and the final challenge for me to actually get out there was getting the visas now i hold an indian passport and it is really hard to get all the visas sorted in time because um when you apply for a visa you give your passport in they take a few weeks to get back to you with your passport basically with the visa stamped in and then only then you can apply for another one so you can't do all of it at the same time so if i was told that for a month your passport will be gone and you will get all of the visas i would be so happy but instead i had to spend a month doing every visa sort of thing and and that's that meant that i didn't have enough time to get my european visa and that meant that i started from australia because i had that visa sorted already and then i didn't have my us visa because i thought they they never gave me an appointment <laughs> so i i thought maybe somehow i can i can apply for like a last minute you know emergency visa thingy express visa that one for the us in when i'm in australia and that didn't happen and i couldn't kind of go to alaska to start my uh, north american leg had to start from canada obviously now you can only apply for a visa three months, like from three months prior to actually going to the country. So once I decided to like start from Australia, I couldn't apply for my European visa before leaving. So it was a mess, the whole visa situation. And it took ages to sort out. And I did not have all my visas on time. So yeah, preparation was not right. And there's so much I would change in terms of how I did things before I left um, yeah <laughs> that's this is what it's all about having this learning curve and going through going through these experiences so what happened with uni did you pause uni did you did you leave uni did you carry on did you graduate not graduate what happened so at the time I paused and I was like right I will come back to the UK as soon as I'm done and I will resume. But what happened is when, when you're on the TFO student visa in the UK as a non-EU student, if you're outside the country for a certain number of months, then your visa gets um, kind of cancelled. So my visa got cancelled, which meant that I had to fly back to India and spend all of that money all over again to get my new student visa go back to the UK and it took like a almost a month when I was in India to sort that visa out so that I can go back to the UK and I continued uni for well what, seven or eight months almost something like that before I decided that okay this is 
really not working out. And I was deep into planning other people's expeditions at the time. And I was deep into the whole expedition management and wanting to start my business based on it and all that. So, yeah, I, I dropped out of uni in kind of after my second year. It's about following your passions and following your interests and following what you're good at. University isn't necessarily for everybody. Let's talk about your your cycle around the world because I knew I know that you had some very interesting and challenging experiences, <laughs> and you even sort of alluded to it earlier in the conversation where a lot of things ended up going wrong. Tell us about Canada and the grizzly bear. What happened there? <laughs> well. I think in that moment, I was the most fortunate person and also the most unfortunate person. <laughs> it was quite funny. So I was doing my thing, riding my bike up the hill, munching on the cliff bar, kind of early evening-ish. And I was like, oh, God, like this could not be better. This is amazing. And I was... 75 kilometers from a place called Golden and towards the end of Glacier National Park and I was just like I remember that was the moment when I, I felt closest to nature even though I was on a highway I was so happy I was like wow I'm in the mountains this is wonderful and I was on this high but anyway I look to my right and I see three bears and I see like basically yeah, three brown bears and I'm kind of like holy shit, that's big. And I was fascinated. I looked and I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like, you don't get to see this every day. But before, like, that that thought lasted for literally a millisecond before I saw <laughs> that this thing was standing on its two feet. And, that, like, the size of it made me think that maybe it could be a grizzly, uh, maybe it could be a male grizzly because it was huge. And I was like, wait what why is it walking to it what and I, <laughs> I i i think in that moment i obviously you're not supposed to run away from it and 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 my 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 spray my bear spray was in my hydration pack inside a hat and it was really not accessible and i was just like shit what are we going to do now so i literally didn't like only looked ahead stood on my pedals and I was just sprinting up this hill and I was going zigzag and I didn't even know where the bear was at that point. I was just going for it. I was just riding up. I wanted to get to the summit and get to the downhill. And it was it was a crazy, crazy incident. But I don't even know how long I was riding for before. It could not have been that long because grizzlies are fast. So it could not have been that long. And there was this big, big black lorry coming from the other side. And it was, I heard screeching of brakes. I heard loud honking. I wasn't even looking up. I wasn't looking ahead at all. I was looking right in front of my bike and I was just going... I didn't realize that I was in the wrong lane. So I was all the way to the left. And this thing comes right in front of me and stops inches away from me. And because of all the screeching and honking, the bear kind of, it drove the bear away. But holy shit, like I look back and I did see that the bear just kind of just went past me and went in the, in the cliff that side. And I was just like, what just happened? And... <laughs> The lorry, like the driver was not happy, he showed me the middle finger and went away. But I remember I, I I was almost at the top, so I kind of walked to the top and then I fell down. And well not fell down, but I put my bike against uh um what's it called? It was like a tourism information thing, tourist information thing. So there was a board, there was like a long drop toilet and stuff like that. So I get my bike there, I just sat sat down like on the on a lay by like thing and I just sat down there and I just started laughing and I was I was like a proper adrenaline rush I was laughing I could not stop laughing and somewhere along the way I had pressed the SOS button on my on my um spot tracker so the film crew which was I think 60 odd kilometers away they got a message and they thought they were going to see me dead the next time they saw me because 
that that was like the emergency button you press when something is properly wrong and yeah anyway I was side of the road just laughing my head off and crying at the same time and then at some point they arrived and I was just I don't know my heart was still racing and I was like okay I'm gonna go I'm gonna stay in this toilet for as long as I need to I'm just gonna stay in here and I just kept talking I would not stop and I was just telling them how I'm gonna bear proof this toilet and I'm gonna make it into my home or something I don't know I was talking a lot of shit that that day <laughs> so yeah basically uh that that, that was how I got chased by a bear and then I started talking shit and I could not stop myself and then they were kind of like V, calm down, like, try riding your bike, try getting on my bike, and I, my muscles were shaking, and, like, I was shaking, I sat on the bike, and I was like, I just can't ride, I need to stop, like, this is too much, <laughs> I had to literally stay the night there, and, you know, start the next day, because I just could not, and, yeah, we, the film crew went back to try and see if the bear was still around or, you know, the other two bears, if they were still around. And somehow in the hurry, I had dropped my cliff bar on the, on the ground. And yeah, we couldn't find like they, well, I wasn't there, but they couldn't find the cliff bar. They couldn't find the bears. And I was just like, I swear it wasn't a dream. Like, I swear, like if that lorry driver is around, <laughs> he will know <laughs> because he was not a happy man he was so angry <laughs> but yeah that that was what happened <laughs> Do you, I, adrenaline is a powerful um uh what's the word? i would say hormone but i'm not sure if adrenaline is a hormone but it's a it's you know it does have a powerful e effect on the body when you get that yeah. uh, you know adrenaline <laughs> rush and then you're you know you're cycling and there is a grizzly bear but it's not only um so you've dealt with grizzly bears in Canada, but you also had a challenging situation in Spain. Do you want to share more about that? Yeah, so the incident in Spain was something that marked an end to what was initially a record attempt to be the fastest woman. So in in Spain, I was trying to make up for a lot of lost time and lost mileage so late in the evening I decided that I was gonna ride into the night and obviously I I was around I think I was close to Merida but not very close so 60 odd kilometers from a place called Merida um, and I was riding when a couple of people on a motorbike they pushed me off my bike and um Basically, the next thing I remember, I was held at a knife point, and it was it was literally a person holding my hands kind of behind and holding me tight, and the uh, knife was right on my neck, and I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> um, and the other person was going through my bags, and he was like, just literally throwing things around. That's what was happening, and um, like I, I I didn't have any idea what they were looking for. And well, well, I didn't know until the next day what had even happened with me, to be fair. And I was kind of, I, I don't know if I was beaten up, but I was pushed around a bit and I was like on the ground after that. And then I was pushed down what felt like a ditch on the side of the road, but like a deep one. So I felt like I went down a bit, I don't know, some into something deep. That's how it felt. And, but the, thing that happened was I fell on my head and I the impact was straight on my head so when I was pushed down I went straight onto my head and I my helmet strap was off because somehow when they pushed me off the bike I thought if I put my helmet strap off and if I throw my helmet onto someone they will get distracted and I can run away or something or we know ride off and um, that was my thinking but obviously that wasn't going to happen um which meant that when I was thrown down that ditch, I hit their head first. And I um, I suffered a really bad case of concussion. And I was unconscious for what felt like a few hours. And when I, when I woke up, I was uh, looking around and I was like, I have no idea where I am. I have no idea what's happening. And then obviously they had thrown the bike on me as well. And I was just like, holy shit, like, is my bike okay? And they hadn't touched the um, 
frame bag. So I just took a torch out of my frame bag where it usually is. Uh, no, it wasn't a torch, it was a headlight. And then I turned it off. I was like, holy, where the, where the hell am I? And I, I walked back up to the road with my bike and my bags were just spread out there. And I was like, I have no idea what's happened. And like in that moment, I genuinely had no idea what had happened. And my head hurt and I... I had like a slight mark on my neck and I was like, I remember there being a knife. I remember there being a motorbike. And I, for a long, long time, I I walked to this gas station and I kept, I really couldn't remember what even my phone password was. And I got there and this guy uh, was like, okay, you you don't look in a good condition basically. And so he took me to a, a cafe for a coffee which was right behind and then from there um there was this family which spoke english who took me to a hospital and yeah that's when we figured out that i i had a um really kind of bad case of concussion because i couldn't kind of keep food down i couldn't think straight i was i was really panicking with everything and in the middle of that I was trying to remember what had happened and I kept repeating this number starting with a B ending with a six and I kept repeating it over and over and over again. And at some point I was told that that's a number of a motorbike. And I was like, yes, there was a motorbike. And that's literally, I kept saying this number and they picked up on that number being a motorbike. And I was like, yes, it was a motorbike. And then I remembered like, I had flashes of memories. I was like, yes, there were two people. Yes, the one of them looked like this Indian actor. And then I, I was just like, oh, shit, so this is what happened to me. I was mugged and there was a knife involved and then they threw me down. And then, yeah, th- then I kind of connected the dots, basically, and realized that I, I was I was properly traumatized by that incident, like like anyone would have, like you you keep thinking that you know uh, I, at least i did growing up that western countries are safe for women and you know you can just go anywhere anytime and nothing could go wrong or the chances of anything going wrong are really slim and i think i was just in for a bit of bad luck that day and <laughs> that happened but i remember when i was held at knife point like now i know why i remember the number plate or you know when i kind of put put the pieces of memories back together. I remember that when I was held at knife point, I was trying to memorize the number of the number plate to keep fear away from me. And, you know, because if I screamed or if I tried to defend myself there, I felt this deep kind of, I really felt it somewhere inside me that if I did anything differently, they would have probably killed me. And that's why I kept like, I let them do what they were doing, but I kept trying to focus on something else. So I was just like, I was looking at the other person's face a lot and trying to figure out how he looked and trying to, you know, memorize the number plate or keeping my head busy, brain busy with, you know, something else. And it was not a fun experience, I must say. Um, and I, it took a lot of time for me to bounce back to normal. And like my, I think the whole, I still had one third way around the world to go. And I have no idea to this day, like, I, I know how bad a concussion is because after that, within a year, I got another one. And it, it it's crazy to think that at that time I was able to push on to the finish line in spite of that and yeah every day I try and remember why I continued back then when I face a challenging situation and I'm like right if I was able to bring myself to finish something that I'd started when I was in such a bad situation then um, I can probably get through any challenge. How did you get past that? How long did it take you to get back to your bike? Like what stuff um, had they taken? Did you, you know, did you lose your passport, your wallet, your phone? Did you have to get stuff replaced? Um, And how long were you sort of in that area for before you carried on with the journey? I think I was in the area uh, for 
four days. The the hospital suggested that I should have stayed in the hospital for like another night or two. And I was like, no, that's not happening. Like, you know, no. And I, I told them, I was like, I'm on a record attempt. I'm going to go and get it. And, you know, I was, yeah, I was just talking absolute shit to them. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, I realized that my bike hadn't majorly broken. So uh, obviously a few gears were jumping or, you know, a few things were wrong with it. But I think I took it as a sign that my bike hadn't broken. In terms of money, I think around three or four hundred pounds were kind of missing from my wallet. Um, And a few other things were missing from my wallet. And I was just like, huh. They could have taken the whole wallet. Why did they just go for the cash? I was like, and oh yeah, and and they took my uh, BRP, biometric residence permit, because I remember applying for visa for Russian visa after that was a bit of a task because I didn't have anything to prove that I live in the UK. Biometric residence permit, yeah, it was lost. It was, they took that as well. But the passport was in my frame bag, which they did not take. And my phone was, I, I was wearing four layers. So my phone was like in the closest layer to my body, basically. <laughs> so that wasn't missing either. And luckily, I wasn't listening to music, which is why there weren't any cords kind of hanging out to give any clues that there's a phone somewhere inside. So, yeah, that was, that was all right. Um, and I think, yeah, it took me around two days to actually get back on the bike, but I wasn't doing mass- massive distances after that. So I did 30 or 40 kilometers, and uh, it was mostly literally every time. Um, so two days later, I got back on the bike, basically, and I was like, okay, I can probably ride. Let's see how far I can go. I'll have my camping gear with me. If I feel shit, I can just, you know camp somewhere or book myself into somewhere or just deal with it basically I remember I rode 30 40 something kilometers that day and I felt so shit I wasn't able to um you know look I I don't know so I did not feel confident riding my bike at all that day every time a car passed every time a big vehicle passed from the other side. Every time a motorbike passed, I freaked out. In like a broad daylight, I just freaked out. I was like, this is not going to work. Like, shit, what's happening with me? And then the day after that, it was again, it was really hard, but I was listening to music and I blocked the sound out. Like, I know you're not supposed to do that, but I put, and then I realized that the music is actually hurting my head even further. And I think the journey from there until at least the end of France was the most painful thing that I've ever experienced. Um, It was really bad. I I don't think I recommend riding after having a concussion (laughs) um, that bad or having a traumatic experience that bad. But yeah, it took me a while. So the distance that I would do in a day I was doing half of that and I was taking the same amount of time uh, to do that and I was really struggling and I was kind of like all of my training and everything feels like it's going to shit because I just it just isn't working out anymore and yeah I just I just knew that I wasn't gonna get that record even if I tried my best because I was trying my best I was giving it my 110 person even to kind of stay upright on the bike and you know riding 100 kilometers was like the day I rode 100 kilometers for the first time after the incident was my biggest achievement and I remember sitting at the side of the road eating grapes and feeling really good about myself because I just rode 100 kilometers and <laughs> I, I know it sounds silly because I was aiming for doing 200 miles each day, which is like 320 kilometers. But after the incident, riding my bike was so hard that even 100 kilometers made me feel like a queen. <laughs> it was that was that was quite funny for me. Yeah, yeah. actually. <laughs> what well, it's a knock to your it's a knock to your confidence, and so you know the fact that you did get back on your bike and start cycling again, and you know you said it yourself 
you were doing your best that you could and actually getting that 100 kilometers did make you feel like a queen and that is 100% <laughs> worth celebrating the fact it must have been hard though knowing that you weren't going to to break the record how did you sort of mentally adjust to that was it just a case of more like okay acceptance um and did it change your riding style did was the pressure off then were you able then maybe to t- to take your time more to to slow down to see more things or did you still have you know a deadline of when you needed to get back home by I don't have a deadline anymore but I felt really kind of bad about myself when I figured that okay this is not going to work out to be a world record or this is not going to break any record for that matter and I was getting the record to be the youngest woman to do it was never a priority it didn't mean that much to me but the fact that I got it it does mean something to me now but at the time it did not mean anything to me and I was kind of like I've got nothing to lose but at the same time it felt like I had lost everything. And every time I felt that, I do remember I stopped riding and I made myself remember how how incredibly lucky I am to be alive because those people could have killed me. That knife was fucking sharp. And there was every way in hell that I could have died that, that day or the time when the grizzly thing happened. Like... There have been times when I could have absolutely been in a lot of trouble or, you know, ended up with a serious injury or died. And and I felt I made myself remember those moments and I made myself kind of feel grateful about it. And I was like, look, you're incredibly lucky to be alive right now. So what you can do, what's in your hands is to continue this journey and make it into something and see I I felt like seeing it through was the only way to to feel good about myself again and I felt like to keep going will make me feel better every day which it did so all the way till France I was feeling super shit about myself and then once France was over I was into Belgium and I saw my friend's sister and I remember having a beer with her and thinking actually now that the whole you know get the record thing is off now that I know that the only 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 reason I'm doing this is to is to have one hell of an adventure I think that's all I'm gonna do I am gonna have one hell of an adventure and then what I did was I didn't tell anyone Uh, so I had a friend in Finland who had told me that he was going to be there for a really short number of days but there was like a short window of time when I could see him because before after that he was going to go back to the UK to continue with uni and I was like how about I do not tell anyone how far I'm going to go where I'm going to go and all that and I just see what I can do when there's no outsider expectations involved and I literally that that was I rode 300 kilometers and usually it would take me what, 15, 16 hours. That took me 23 hours, 24 hours. Like literally it, it took me almost a day. And yet once I was done with that, I was so proud of myself. I was like, Hey, I'm back. I can do 300 kilometers again. <laughs> and, and that's when I was like, right, I'm not going to sleep now. I'm just going to continue because I want to, now that I know that, with no other, like, with no outside expectations, now that I know that I can perform, and I'm just going to switch off my phone, switch off everything I have, and just be with myself, and do what I do, and try and do it well, and yeah, I was in Finland, and I was, I remember I had averaged 300 kilometers, and it was less than a month, no, it was just over a month after the incident, I think, Shit, I don't really remember when it was, but it could have been just over a month. Um, And yeah, I was still riding. I was able to do over 300 kilometers, just over. Well, and I got to Finland and that was when I realized that, yeah, I'm I'm back. You're back. Yeah, that was like, yep, I'm having one hell of an adventure and I'm loving it now. 
you've shown so much grit and courage and determination and there is an amazing new book out called tough women adventure stories which shares stories of grit courage and determination it's edited by jenny tough who's also um, been on the tough girl podcast a few times to share more about her adventures but tell us more about the book tough women adventure stories and you've got a chapter i believe in the book um what what do you share in the book in the book, I share the story of basically how I overcame the whole getting mugged at knife point and, you know, how life went on, basically, and how I was able to continue the journey. And I also share an incident from from Canada when I had lung infection and because of the forest fires and how hard it was to ride and how I was massively failing at everything. And... Yeah, I felt really shit back then uh, in in Canada and with the forest fires and all and how I kind of got through that, got over that and was able to continue. So I kind of share stories on the lines of being in difficult situations and finding it somewhere in me to keep going. Fantastic. Well, I will make sure that I share the links to that book. And then you did talk about the film as well. What's happening with the film or the documentary? Ooh, <laughs> I have no idea what's happening with it because the production company, um, I think, um, so they have the footage, I believe, but we haven't spoken with what's happening with it yet because I'm, I, I'm thinking of going out and, you know, going around the world again. So we were kind of thinking that maybe we could combine the footage from the new expedition and the expedition from back then and kind of put it together and make it into something but yeah <laughs> that's not for a few years though is that to to go for the world record the women's world record yeah yeah that's that's part of it but it's also to get some closure from everything that happened in the last one because i still like there are still times when i really feel shit about myself thinking how I really, really, really wanted to and had trained for getting that record and I did not. And I think the only way sometimes to bounce back feels like, oh, I, I feel like I can go back and get the record or at least attempt it again. Or, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to actually, um, when I'm going to do it. I know I will, I will cycle around the world again probably give me three years, two years, something like that. <laughs> so, Vidangi, one of the amazing things that, that you've launched re- recently is something called the Adventure Planning Crash Course, which sounds absolutely amazing. But I'd love for you to share more about the course, uh, what's involved and how people can buy it and support you while also gaining new skills for themselves. <laughs> Thank you, first of all. Adventure Planning Crash Course is a course that's designed to help you plan your adventures and it lasts over the course of four weeks and there are video from whenever you sign up and there are videos for every element of uh, planning an adventure basically and there's a workbook that goes along and by the end of the four weeks you will basically have planned your adventure and some amazing guest experts um, I've managed to that I've managed to interview have shared some really cool stories from their adventures to kind of inspire the participants basically. And we've got people like Jenny Tuff. We've got people like uh, Jenny has um, run across uh, quite a few mountain ranges, (laughs) completely like solo and self-supported. And she's run across five out of six uh, mountain ranges across each continent basically then there is jasmine Mueller, who is a 24-hour world champion there is joe cantello um who is basically an an agent for several amazing adventurers um there is sophie pavel who is an um well um a communicator, science communicator, basically. And she is super inspirational, currently also writing a book. And um, there is Inga Kenobi, who also plans expeditions. And the idea is that you basically also every week of the adventure planning crash course, a a couple of videos 
couple of workbooks and a couple of interviews are dropped and they all kind of run with the theme of that week. And yeah, by the end of the four weeks, you will be super inspired and you will have hopefully planned your adventures. There's also one-on-one call, calls involved to kind of discuss your personal circumstances to do with your adventures. And on request, there are some webinars that you can be a part of as well. Um, I'm working on creating a Facebook private group for people who are who, who are kind of the participants of this course. And yeah, all in all, I am super happy to be putting this out there. And my I for this whole adventure planning thing that I'm doing, for this whole expedition management thing, actually, I've started a business called The Adventure Shed. And Adventure Planning Crash Course is kind of my first launch through The Adventure Shed. Um, so I'm still new at this. I'm only 21. And I'm at no point am I saying that I know the best, but I've made quite a few bad decisions in my life in terms of adventures. <laughs> so I've learned a lot from those. And yeah, that I'm, I'm just putting out what I've learned and the way it can help many others. So yeah, that's Adventure Planning Crash Course. Fantastic. And where can people find out more information out about you, follow along with you on social media? Where do you spend most time? What's uh, What are your social media handles? So my social media handle is wheels and words. And that's because I love to write uh, <laughs> and I love telling stories. Uh, I've also started a YouTube channel and I'm currently editing a couple new videos for it. Um, and for Adventure Planning Crash Course, you can go on www.theadventureshed.com and you'll find all the information on there. I'm currently also working on um, basically starting a blog on the on, on the adventure shed where I share kind of, you know, stories and musings from, from the outdoors basically. So yeah, follow along. Fantastic. Let's we, have some fun. <laughs> absolutely. We will do. And I'll make sure I put all of the links in the show notes available at tubcarchallenges.com. Um, but Vidangi, I'd love for you to leave our listeners with final words of advice and wisdom from cycling around the world all before the age of 21 you're doing such incredible stuff and I'm, I know everyone will be so excited um you know to to support you and to see what you are going to be doing um next but yeah final words of advice and top tips oh thank you Sarah that's very kind of you to say um I think as far as advice is concerned I would say don't be afraid to ask for help I think it's important to learn from experiences your own, but also from other people. So if you're in doubt, don't be afraid to ask for help to people who may have done the adventure that you're looking into um, before. But also don't take people for their word with everything. Like, and, and I think a final thing would be you are stronger than you think. I've noticed like yeah definitely you're stronger than you think and whatever it is that you're planning to do you've got this <laughs> it's only literally it's all about getting out the door and getting started with it and yeah you've got this you're stronger than you think yes you are and what a way to finish Vidangi thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about um, your incredible ride around the world and what you've learned from that experience Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It's such an honor to be speaking to you. Hey, Tribe. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Vidangi. What an absolute inspiration. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. I am so excited to have Vidangi come on the Tough Girl podcast and share more about her incredible life and journey. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check out the main website for more information. 
We've got two exciting episodes coming up in the following week. We're going to be speaking with Ashley Winchester. She's an ultra runner focused on FKTs, fastest known times. And she's also the host of the Women of the Wild podcast. Women of the Wild podcast was started in December 2019 with the aim to inspire, educate and empower women in the outdoors. On the 29th of September, we're going to be speaking with Kara Yar Khan. She is a humanitarian and disability advocate who's going to be sharing more about her life and doing a 12-day Grand Canyon descent and expedition. And what makes this challenge even more special is that Kara is currently deep in the throes of an aggressive fatal muscle wasting disease. And she's going to be sharing more about her life and the different challenges that she's faced and is still facing. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast come out on a Tuesday and Thursday at 7am UK time. The Tough Girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. If you want to support the work that I'm doing, then please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast and sign up to become a patron. You can sign up in sterling, dollars and euros. There is a monthly option as well as an annual option. Thank you again to everybody who is supporting the Tough Girl Podcast. It makes a world of difference knowing that you believe in me and believe in the Tough Girl mission. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it. You've got one life, so live it. I'll be back with you next Tuesday. Lots of love. Bye.